So this video is just going to go over the definition and direction of our periodic table trends. That's going to get us ready for the discussions we'll have in class about how we justify and understand these periodic table trends based on the structure of the atom. So atomic radius is exactly what it sounds like. It's the distance from the nucleus to the edge of the electron cloud, just like the radius of a circle. So it's kind of a measure of how big is my atom. And the trend going down a group is pretty relatable. I don't think anybody is going to be terribly surprised that lithium with three electrons is smaller than rubidium with 37 electrons. So going down a vertical group, the atomic radius is increasing. But going across the horizontal period, the trend is a little bit unexpected. If you're using the same idea that you have with, say, lithium and rubidium, then if I look across period two, and I look at lithium and fluorine. Well, lithium has three electrons and fluorine has nine. So one would think that perhaps fluorine is larger. You'd be wrong. Fluorine is a smaller atom than lithium, even though it has more electrons. So going across the horizontal period, instead of growing larger, the atoms are actually getting smaller. So increasing atomic radius, it increases to the left, and it increases going down. So francium here at the bottom of the main body of the periodic table would be very large. Fluorine up here towards the top is very small. Another periodic trend is the trend in Pauling electronegativity. Linus Pauling comes up with this and he bases all of these values off of fluorine. Fluorine is basically four and it's the highest number. So everything is going to be related to a fraction of the number four. Electronegativity has to do with what's going on when a atom is in a molecule. How much does it pull on that shared pair of electrons in a bond? And the higher the electronegativity, basically the more it pulls on that shared pair towards itself, to the point where if the electronegativity difference is very large, we actually end up with ions over a covalent bond. So electronegativity, as you can see here, is going to be decreasing as I go down. So if you like drawing arrows as things increase, increase as it goes up. It also increases as I go left to right across a period. So I can make an arrow going up. It increases up the group and across, like I'm reading, across left to right. So fluorine is extremely electronegative, cesium, and francium down here would be extremely not electronegative. And this is going to help us when we look at chemical bonding and we're trying to decide if a bond is polar or nonpolar, which we'll talk about a lot in unit two and three. So uh, one thing I would like you to notice is that carbon and hydrogen are very, very close to each other. So that bond in AP chemistry and in organic chemistry is basically considered to be nonpolar. Another trend we looked at in first year was the first ionization energy. So first ionization energy is going to be the amount of energy required to take one mole of electrons off of one mole of atoms. So one electron per atom. One, elect, one mole of electrons from one mole of atoms, so one electron per atom. And this has the same trend as electronegativity. 
which kind of makes sense if you think about it. If something is very electronegative, it attracts electrons towards itself, then it should be pretty difficult to pull electrons away from it because it's a very attractive two electrons. So the same trend for electronegativity follows for your ionization energy. It increases as I go up, it increases as I move towards the right. So over here, where there are metals that form cations, it is easy to ionize, to remove one electron from sodium or potassium. Over here, where I have atoms that form anions, like my halogens or my group 16, oxygen, sulfur, those have very high ionization energies. It's much more difficult to pull the electron off. Hence, we form anions. Another trend we can look at is ionic radii. And there's, on here we have the radius of the ion, that's the top number, and the radius of the neutral atom, that is the bottom number here. And the neutral atom is in brown, and the comparative ionic radii is colored on this side. Over here we have the neutral atom and the blue is the ion. So there's a couple of things that we can see here. One, cations are always smaller than their neutral parent. So sodium plus is much smaller than sodium neutral. You also see that this effect increases as I get more positive. Aluminum three plus is smaller than magnesium, is smaller than sodium. So the greater the positive charge, the smaller the ion is. If I look at anions or negative ions, we notice the trend is opposite. An anion is always larger than the neutral atom. So if nitrogen three minus is, seven, is 171, nitrogen is 70. You also notice that the trend is that the more negative it is, the more pronounced that effect. So a sulfur two minus ion is larger than a chlorine one minus ion. So kind of as a rule of thumb, cations are always smaller, anions are always bigger. The greater the charge, the greater the effect. So more positive charge, smaller ion, more negative charge, larger ion. So this last one is our new one. That is the electron affinity. And that's the energy that is associated with adding an electron to a gaseous atom. So there's a couple of things to note here. Even when something is diatomic, I am talking about one electron, one atom. And I am talking about things being a gas. So I'm not talking about trying to add this to liquid bromine. I'm gonna make that bromine a gas and break the bromine-bromine bond before I even start talking about electron affinity. So there are a couple of things that are a little odd about electron affinity. Sometimes you will see this reported as a positive number because they're saying this is the amount of energy released. Well, we know from first year that when energy is released, that's exothermic, and the energy usually is negative. Well, when I say energy released, I'm kind of implying the negative number there. So sometimes you'll see this reported as a positive. It's not tremendously common, but I'd like you to have it in your head somewhere. The trend is not very clear along a period, and we'll talk about why that is. But just to kind of have a basic rule of thumb, if it is likely to form a negative ion, then it should have a fairly large electron affinity. So the trend down a group is pretty simple. The electron affinity is going to be lower, it's gonna be a smaller negative number 
as I go down a group. So fluorine, which is very electronegative and has a very high ionization energy, gets a lot of energy released when you add an electron to it. We know fluorine makes fluorine one minus, so that shouldn't be too surprising. So the trend down the group is pretty simple. The trend across a period is kind of odd. We'll talk about a couple of those exceptions in class. So here are two electron affinity charts just because I wanted you to see that you do see them both as positive and negative numbers. And so you're going to really have to look at the magnitude and look at changes in sign. So you can see that the larger magnitude numbers, whether I have them as being positive or negative numbers are over here, where I would expect to be forming negative ions and my smaller or even positive or not even reported numbers are here where I would expect to be getting cations, losing electrons rather than gaining electrons. So one thing to think about now that you have all of your directions and definitions is why is it that column 1A has a greater affinity than column 2? or column 14 has a greater affinity than column 15. Just something to think about, and we'll get to talking more about periodic trends and justifications in class.